Hello everyone. In this lecture I'll be reviewing lipid droplets, um, how they're formed, how they're degraded, and what goes on at the endoplasmic reticulum lipid droplet contact sites. I'll finish the presentation by reviewing this excellent paper by Yuki et al. titled RAB18 promotes lipid droplet growth by tethering the ER to lipid droplets through the SNARE and NRZ uh, complex interactions. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so lipid droplets. Lipid droplets are organelles that accumulate neutral lip lipids like di diacylglycerol or triacylglycerol, and they broadly function to maintain metabolic homeostasis. So although lipid droplets do contain a, a phospholipid monolayer, they accumulate neutrally charged uh, lipids, allowing them to pack together very, very densely. And there's some recent research suggesting that lipid droplets are also important for signaling uh, but these ideas are currently pretty under uh, underdeveloped, so I don't uh, I don't think I can really give much of a presentation on that. And instead, I'll focus on how lipid droplets function to maintain metabolic homeostasis. Lipid droplets synthesized in the uh, cytoplasm can be transferred to the ER, and then they're stored in lipid droplets. So we're going to dive into this pathway in a moment. But essentially, uh, lipid droplets are formed from lipids derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. Starvation, or uh, high energy demand in general, activates various lipid droplet associated lipases, causing them to release the diacylglycerol and triacylglycerol as free fatty acids that can then enter beta oxidation. Uh, beta oxidation is the metabolic pathway through which free fatty acids are broken down into uh, acetyl-CoA. As acetyl-CoA can then enter the citric acid cycle, it can make uh, NADH and ultimately produces ATP. So these lipids, uh, I should note, these free fatty acids can also uh, be used for things like uh, the diacylglycerol protein kinase C signaling pathway, the calcium activated, uh, you know, the IP3R receptors, inositol 3-phosphate, um, that can be activated by diacylglycerol. That's another pathway that uh, can arise from, from uh, lipases. You also see uh, phospholipid synthesis uses free fatty acids, uh, protein lipidation, and uh, many other things as well. So although lipid droplets are commonly associated with uh, adipose tissue, they are in fact found in nearly all cell types. Lipid droplets in adipocytes are generally extremely large and they are um, obviously responsible for obesity, uh, which is probably why it, they get the most attention, but uh, lipid droplets are in most cells, so it's important to understand exactly what they're doing in other cell types. For example, in brain tissue, lipid droplets are formed in primarily in astrocytes in response to reactive oxygen species. So a very new paper published in uh, 2017 by Louis et al., found that neuron reactive oxygen species production triggered lipid droplet accumulation in astrocytes and disrupting this process led to neurodegeneration. So lipid droplets are very fascinating uh, even outside of obesity and other metabolic syndrome uh, research and they're implicated in neurodegenerative diseases as well. A couple of bona fide lipid droplet diseases, are, uh, they're called neutral lipid storage diseases. They're associated with uh, myopathy, uh, autism or general intellectual disabilities, uh, loss of eyesight and hearing. So these diseases are marked by the inability to access lipid stores within the lipid droplets. So it, it, the inability to break down lipids causes a very uh, pleiotropic range of very serious symptoms. Um, the most serious probably being cardiomyopathy or just uh, heart failure typically. Various uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in lipid droplets associate uh, in lipid droplet associated proteins have been linked to this disease called hereditary spastic uh, paraplegia. So uh, hered hereditary plastic uh, paraplegia is a class of motor neuron degenerative diseases. There's a couple different types, but uh, there's there's various mutations in lipid droplet associated proteins that have been linked to this. Uh, uh, motor neuron degenerative disease. And lastly, 
Uh, lipid droplet dynamics have also um, observed to be weird in Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's disease. So these last two points I, I just added, I, I wanted to add them to emphasize that lipid droplets are important uh, to not just bona fide metabolic syndromes, but they're also important to our understanding of neurodegenerative diseases. In Huntington's disease, for example, um, a recent paper found that Drosophila uh, HD model organisms had roughly 50% more lipid droplets in the early stages of disease, but by the terminal stages of the disease, they had 50% less lipid droplets. And this has implications for human disease because HD patients are known to have a very hard time gaining weight, and they're generally much thinner than control patients. So there's a real possibility that Huntington's disease is a metabolic disorder of the brain. And also in, in Alzheimer's disease, one of the most important risk factors is the APOE4 allele. And APOE4 is a lipid transport protein. So not only that, but uh, Alzheimer's disease patients also show lipid droplet accumulation. And uh, these lipid droplets tend to associate with amyloid beta plaques. Anyways, these might seem kind of random, but the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because I'm trying to convince you that lipid droplets are interesting and they're not just um, reserved for metabolic syndromes, but they're also uh, important to understand as an organelle, as they're increasingly being recognized as. Anyways, let's uh, let's go into some of the pathways and how they how lipid droplets affect cellular function, how they're degraded, how they're formed, etc. So in this slide, we're going to talk about some of the mechanisms of tri triggering uh, lipid droplet degradation. Um, so this is going to be our lipid droplet right here. And this is going to be in the cytoplasm of the cell. It has a phospholipid monolayer. Um, in terms of, of signals, upstream signals that trigger the degradation of our already formed lipid droplet, some of the most important are simply starvation. Starvation, it's obvious we'd want to degrade lipids at that point. And also uh, AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Uh, if AMP concentrations are high, that means ATP concentrations are low and thus another indicator of starvation. So these are some of the main signals. How do they do that? They actually signal primarily through this protein called AMPK, um, AMP uh, kinase. It's a, it's a kinase that requires AMP binding. It requires AMP to bind allosterically to activate its kinase activity. And when AMP binds to AMPK, we get activated AMPK activated AMPK will then phosphorylate and inhibit a, a protein that coats the surface of lipid droplets. This uh, protein is called um, perilipin, perilipin 1 and 2. They're uh, homologs, I believe. Perilipin 1 and 2. So this is a protein that coats the uh, monolayer, out, on the outside monolayer of lipid droplets, and they're basically inhibitory proteins. They inhibit the degradation of the lipid droplet. They function as barriers. They're protecting the lipid droplet. Um, it's perilipin 1 and 2. Or if, if it's abbreviated, it's commonly abbreviated PLIN, P-L-I-N 1 or 2. And AMPK will phosphorylate and inhibit this protein. And we'll see in a second exactly what that does. But before we do that, let's talk about another signal that comes down and inhibits perilipin 1 and 2. And this is going to be uh, commonly th done through G proteins. Oops. So um, G protein. Uh, G protein receptor activation, let's say. A, a common G protein that's activated uh, to eventually cause lipid droplet degradation is the, um, the beta adrenergic receptor. It binds um, things like dopamine, or it can also bind um, adrenaline or norepinephrine, all these different things. And it's a G protein, which means it signals through its, its beta gamma subunits. And it, it, these beta gamma subunits will bind and activate a protein called uh, adenyl cyclase. 
adenylyl cyclase. So what adenylyl cyclase does is it uh, it, it takes six, it turns ATP or, or I think actually AMP, ATP, I think it's ATP. It turns ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is a really common second messenger that uh, basically amplifies this original uh, signaling. Cyclic AMP uh, is able to then bind allosterically to another very important protein, PKA, protein kinase A. It's, it binds in a very specific binding pocket. I forget what the domain is called, but cyclic AMP will bind to protein kinase A. When protein kinase A is activated, it will phosphorylate and deactivate perilipin 1 and 2. So these are the two primary mechanisms of inactivating perilipin 1 or 2 through starvation, which activates AMPK, because AMP binds to AMPK, and G-protein receptor activation can trigger adenylyl cyclase, which will, psych, uh, will, will make cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP binds to protein kinase A and activates it allosterically. And a, a third mechanism of inhibiting uh, perilipin 1 and 2 is through chaperone-mediated autophagy. Chaperone mediated autophagy is, is kind of like proteasomal degradation, but instead of escorting a protein to the proteasome, it escorts the protein to the lysosome and basically funnels the protein into the lysosome directly. This is primarily done through HSC70. HSC70 is a heat shock protein that can um, bind a certain misfolded substrate or if it's activated in some in some way, it can bind in certain proteins. And HSC70 will actually pick out perilipin 1 and 2 and then transport to a lysosome and, deg and degrade it. So a couple different mm, uh, things that inhibit perilipin 1, but I haven't actually talked about why perilipin 1 is important. Why are we talking about perilipin 1? Okay, let's answer that question. Perilipin 1 inhibits another protein on the uh, surface of lipid droplets uh, called CGI, CGI58. CGI58 is constitutively inhibited by perilipin 1 and 2. And the reason that's important is because CGI58 is a co-activator of the, the lipase that begins the uh, degradation of uh, the, the neutral lipids in the lipid droplet. So I'll draw these two guys together. What's happening is, is CGI58 activates, is a, co, is a, is a, a critical coenzyme in the activation of ATGL. ATGL is a, a lipase that turns triacylglycerol into diacylglycerol. And it's basically the first step to degrading uh, the, the triacylglycerols that, are, that have built up inside of the lipid droplet. So in order to be activated, ATGL needs its co-activator CGI58, but CGI58 is under const constant uh, inhibition by uh, the perilipin 1 and 2. So perilipin 1 and 2 need to be silenced either through uh, phosphorylation by AMPK, phosphorylation by PKA, or degradation by uh, HSC70 mediated chaperone, mediated autophagy. Okay, so let's say all that perilipin 1 and 2 is inhibited, what happens? Our triacylglycerol will begin to, be, to get degraded. It gets uh, first cleaved into diacylglycerol by ATGL. ATGL cleaves triacylglycerol into diacylglycerol. Uh, a quick word about diacylglycerol, as I mentioned earlier. Diacylglycerol can, uh, it can possibly at this point be released and it binds to uh, inos, uh, inos, uh, inositol triphosphate receptors, IP3Rs, on the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's say this is the ER. These IP3 receptors um, can release calcium. So I just wanted to add that real quick. It's not totally relevant, but this diacylglycerol that's generated through this mechanism can diffuse out of the lipid droplet and activate IP3R receptors and, and lead to calcium flux. 
but more commonly, our diacylglycerol is cleaved into uh, monoacylglycerol. And the protein that does this is HSL, HSL um, hormone responsive lipase, and it will cleave diacylglycerol into monoacylglycerol, MAG. Once we have produced monoacylglycerol, it can then almost finally be released. It interacts with uh, MGL, monoacylglycerol lipase, also on the membrane of lipid droplets. And finally, our, our lipid escapes from the lipid droplet. And specifically, it gets released as a free fatty acid and it's uh, glycerol head group. So free fatty acid and glycerol get released. Um, at this point, the free fatty acid gets recognized by a fatty acid binding protein. You can't just have free fatty acids floating around in the cell. They're hydrophobic. They would uh, form aggregates. Anyways, the fatty acid binding protein will escort the free fatty acid to sites of beta oxidation, um, which will basically make acetyl-CoA, and which is then funneled into the mitochondria to make a citric acid cycle, makes NADH, eventually makes ATP. Okay. Um, also, free fatty acids can not just bind uh, fatty acid binding proteins, but they can also bind uh, uh, peroxidome proliferation activated receptors. The most common one that we hear talked about is PPRY gamma. It's a, a protein that, it's actually a transcription factor that will, can bind free fatty acids. When, when PP, uh, PPARY or gamma binds to a free fatty acid, it will then uh, form a heterodimer with uh, retin, uh, retinoid, retinoid uh, X receptors and then translocate to the nucleus where it influences um, gene expression. And exactly what that gene expression is depends on the cell type and many other things. But it's also important to note that free fatty acids can be signaling molecules and they can signal through PP, PPAR gamma to influence gene expression. And PPRY gamma, again, can directly bind to free fatty acids, and this uh, allows it to bind retino, uh, retinoid X receptors. Aside from all this, one thing that's important to note is that when these lipases are knocked out, for example, if we were to knock out ATGL, we still see lipid drop, or we, see, we still see lipid droplets getting degraded. How does that happen? Uh, lipophagy or autophagy of lipid droplets. So our autophagosome, let's say this is an autophagosome, can LC3, which is the basically the, uh, the membrane surface protein of an autophagosome, can recognize some receptor on lipid droplets and it induces the the, um, the the lipophagy of the lipid droplet. And once the lipid droplet is in these um, autophagosomes, there's var various uh, acid lipases that can degrade the uh, diacyl, triacyl, and monoacyl glycerols that are present in the lipid droplet. So the loss of this pathway doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world. Lipid droplets can still be degraded through lipophagy, but it, it tends to be more tissue specific and it varies by cell type as to how important it is. But the general idea, it's, it's very undeveloped, underdeveloped right now, but LC3, which coats the um, autophagic membrane, recognizes some kind of uh, ubiquitinated substrate on the lipid droplet. Although exactly what gets uh, ubiquitinated on the lipid droplet is not understood, but it could be this, pro uh, Right now, a lot of evidence is pointing towards this protein called AUP, ancient ubiquitinated protein. It's found on lip, uh, lipid droplets, but um, still needs to be investigated. 
Um, if you're interested in uh, autophagy, I have a lecture on it, but the synopsis is LC3 binds to a polyubiquitinated protein on lipid droplets, and that induces um, the, the formation of the, the vacuole around the lipid droplet and then degradation by acid lipases. So uh, primary activators of lipophagy, starvation, AMP, signal through AMPK, inhibit perilipin 1 and 2, also G protein mediated production of cyclic AMP, activates PKA, also phosphorylates and inactivates perilipin 1 and 2. And the inhibition of perilipin 1 and 2 is kind of the critical event in initiating this whole cascade because it relieves the inhibition on CGI58. And CGI58 is the co-activator of ATGL. Uh, just a really quick correction. Uh, diacylglycerol does not activate the inositol triphosphate receptor. It activates protein kinase C. It allosterically binds and activates protein kinase C. And I forgot the, the head group from um, the cleavage of inositol uh, or phosphatidyl inositol is the inositol triphosphate that activates the IP3 receptors and leads, leads to calcium flux. But diacylglycerol is also a product from that reaction. That's why I got it confused. But diacylglycerol can diffuse out and activate protein kinase C. And if there's also calcium flux in the cell, calcium binds protein kinase C and also activates it. In order to begin this next slide, we need to talk about acetyl-CoA. So in this slide, we're going to be talking about uh, fatty acid synthesis, how lipid droplets are constructed. And the most important, most basic unit for lipids is going to be acetyl-CoA. Where does acetyl-CoA come from? It comes from uh, pyruvate. Pyruvate dehydrogenase can yield uh, acetyl-CoA. Uh, Acetyl-CoA is also uh, come from mitochondria. Various different reactions can produce acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can be exported from the mitochondria. Um, but the thing about acetyl-CoA is that it's it's not doesn't have to become a lipid. It can do a lot of different things. It hasn't made its life uh, decision. So in order for acetyl-CoA to be committed to the synthesis of fatty acids, it needs to be converted into this other protein, or the, sorry, this other molecule called uh, malonyl-CoA. This malonyl-CoA molecule is uh, produced from the enzymatic activity of ACC. ACC stands for acetyl-CoA uh, carbo carboxylase. So the carboxylation of acetyl-CoA yields malonyl-CoA. And malonyl-CoA is our, our committed step in fatty acid synthesis. If you have any malonyl CoA you have is going to be made into a lipid. And to, uh, to do this, to be made into uh, free fatty acid, it, it gets churned through this seven subunit uh, huge complex called fatty acid synthase. It, it, it takes lots of malonyl CoAs and it just starts uh, uh, clipping them together until you get a, a fatty acid chain and you get your free fatty acid. Remember though that lipid droplets are made out of diacylglycerol and triacylglycerol. So how do these free, acid, free, free fatty acids get uh, uh, condensed with glycerol and another fatty acid to make, you know, what actually goes into a lipid droplet? And so obviously glycerol needs to be conjugated to, its free, to a free fatty acid. So we have glycerol and our free fatty acid that come together. And they're actually going to be put together at the ER. So this is our ER membrane. ER membrane. And there's two really critical ER embedded membrane proteins that facilitate this process. Uh, one is called GPAT4. GPAT4, and the other one is called uh, 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 DGAT1 and 2. They're kind of confusing because they're so similar. So DGAT1 and 2 and GPAT4 function to 
uh, basically turn or condense this free fatty, these free fatty acids and glycerol into uh, triacylglycerol and diacylglycerol. And I'm not going to get into the specific steps, but that's pretty much the gist of it, is that these triacylglycerols and diacylglycerols are being made um, at the ER membrane by uh, GPAT4 and DGAT1 and 2. And these two proteins are absolutely critical to the formation of lipid droplets. Uh, probably shouldn't draw the lipid droplets down here, or sorry, the diacylglycerol, triacylglycerol, because they're getting made into the membrane, right? They're not just floating around. And they, they typically, when there's a lipid droplet about to form, it forms what's called a lens. This is called a, an ER membrane lens. And the reason that they're forming is because all these uh, triacylglycerols and diacylglycerols are accumulating in these little lenses. And, and no one necessarily understands what the importance of that is, but uh, that is how the lipid droplets begin to form is actually form inside the ER membrane, kind of like they're growing in specific spots. They're kind of uh, uh, budding out, I guess, or bulging out. And that's the beginning of the lipid droplet. And then somehow lipid droplet turns into something like this. So this is a mirror lipid droplet that has formed. Lipid there. droplet. I can't draw it now. Okay, so this is our lipid droplet right over here. And our lipid droplet is full of these diacyl and triacyl glycerols formed from GPAT4 and DGAT, uh, DGAT1 and 2. And importantly, in order for our lipid droplet to form and not be degraded, it needs to be covered with these uh, perilipin 1 and 2s. We talked about them earlier. Uh, they, they stabilize the membrane, prevent it from getting degraded. And they basically coat, they coat the membrane to protect it from the lipases. And at this point, uh, we're pretty much done with the pathway because not a whole lot is understood with uh, how lipid droplets form. There's a couple proteins that are important, or I should also mention, sorry, the lipid droplet uh, membrane at this point is continuous with the ER membrane. So I'm drawing the ER membrane because it's continuous with, with the forming lipid droplet. And so some models uh, propose that lipid droplets are formed from just the simple diffusion of diacylglycerols in the membrane of the ER, just diffusing into the lipid droplet. So it may not be a, a entirely active process, it could just be simple diffusion. And uh, so there's two other proteins that I wanted to mention that I don't know what to say a whole lot about them, but they are really important and they're, they're implicated in this process. The thing is no one necessarily knows what they do. They're important, but no one knows what they do. When these proteins are knocked out, they cause a uh, lipodystrophy, the inability to form lipid droplets, uh, FIT, was it FIT M2, and uh, BSCL2. These proteins are found at the, the neck of forming lipid droplets. They, in some way, they are facilitating this movement of triacylglycerol, diacylglycerol into the forming lipid droplet. And FITM2 and BSCL2 are important for the formation of lipid droplets. And I don't know what else I can really say about that. Uh, BC, B, uh, BSCL2 is enriched in the brain. And when it's knocked out, it causes lipid droplet abnormalities primarily in the brain. Um, it, it also causes intellectual disability when it's knocked out. Um, other than that, this is the general pathway. We have pyruvate coming from, or silicoA coming directly from pyruvate dehydrogenase or from our mitochondria gets exported. It gets uh, carboxylated into malonyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA is our committed step of fatty acid synthesis. Fatty acid synthase picks up malonyl-CoAs, starts conjugating them together to make fatty acids, free fatty acids. Free fatty acids get 
combined, condensed with glycerol by GPAT4 and DGAT1 and 2, making a, tr a triacylglycerols, diacylglycerols. They begin to form a lens in the ER membrane, which eventually forms our lipid droplet. And that is, uh, that is the story. So lipid droplet biogenesis involves the transfer of ER-derived lipids. But again, exactly how this occurs is not understood. Mechanisms involving the direct membrane fusion followed by intermembrane diffusion have been proposed. So we kind of talked about that in the last slide. Uh, RAB proteins, which have long been associated with organelle transport and identity, have only one family member localized to lipid droplets, and that's RAB18. So RAB18 is the lip or the RAB protein that associates with lipid droplets. And RAB proteins are often used to identify very specific vesicles or organelles. For example, uh, RAB5 associates with early endosomes. RAB7 associates with late endosomes. RAB1 uh, with the Golgi, etc. RAB18 is the lipid droplet associated RAB protein. Since lipid droplet localization to the ER is critical for its growth, the or and the RAB class of proteins are known to facilitate organelle transport, the authors of, the, of this current paper uh, sought to examine RAB18's role in lipid droplet formation. They also note that RAB18 point mutations uh, have been observed in this uh, War Warburg micro syndrome. This Warburg micro syndrome is characterized by enlarged lipid droplets and severe intellectual disability. Furthermore, uh, RAB, uh, RAB3 gap mutations were also shown to cause this uh, Warburg micro syndrome. And we're going to see in the next slide that RAB3 gaps are responsible for activating RAB18. So the thing that activates RAB18 and RAB18 cause this lipid droplet disease, uh, or it's not necessarily characterized as a lipid droplet disease, it's characterized as uh, intellectual development um, syndromes, but it's, it's associated with enlarged lipid droplets. So the authors discover that RAB18 following activation by RAB3 gap uh, localizes the lipid droplets and functions to tether the organelle to the ER via the NRZ and ER snare complex. So, and, and, and we're gonna discuss this in the next slide in, in great detail, but uh, the loss of RAB18 or its uh, upstream, uh, upstream GEF, RAB3 GAP, disrupts the proper uh, maturation of lipid droplets while leaving lipid droplet biogenesis intact. So note that RAB3 GAP uh, is not a GAP. It's not a guanine activating protein in this context. So this will be confusing, but RAB3 GAP is a RAB18 GEF or guanine exchange uh, factor. It's exchanging the uh, GDP of RAB18 for GTP, thus activating it and allowing it to add, interact with various effector proteins. Anyways, if, the, if that was confusing, uh, we're gonna go through the, uh, the pathway in the next slide, it'll make a whole lot more sense. So imagine our lipid droplet out here in space, it's been formed, it's quite large. This is our lipid droplet and attached to our lipid droplet are these RAB3 uh, gaps that are functioning as a GEF. So we have a RAB3 gap. There's actually two different isoforms or uh, homologs, RAB3 gap one and RAB3 gap two. Eh, not too important. But they are localized to the lipid droplets, um, phospholipid monolayer on the outside of that. And what do they do? They are RAB18 GEFs. So what they do is they take RAB18 uh, GDP, they simply convert RAB18 GDP into RAB18 GTP. They are exchanging the G, uh, GDP for GTP. Why is that important? 
That's important because RAB18 GDP is not active. It's totally inactive. It doesn't do anything. When RAB18 gains GTP, it's able to uh, associate with the lipid droplet membrane. Not sure how, but it does. And it's also able to interact with various effector proteins. It's able to interact with other, uh, a, a whole new class of proteins. This whole, uh, whole new class of proteins, one really important one that's investigated in this paper is this one. This is a complex called the uh, NR NRZ uh, tethering complex. NRZ tethering complex. And it's composed of three different proteins. That's why I've made this such a large complex. Uh, the, the N stands for the NAG, the NAG protein. The R stands for the RENT1 RENT protein. And the Z stands for the ZW10 protein. So we actually have three different proteins in this complex. ZW10 is the protein that directly interacts with uh, RAB18 GTP. Then we have these two other proteins in here, NAG and RENT. So it's a tethering complex. What is it, tether to? Well, we've been kind of alluding to this idea. It tethers to the ER membrane. So I'm make the ER membrane a little bit large. This is going to be our ER membrane. This over here is going to be the ER. And the tethering complex is able to tether to the ER membrane because it interacts with a snare complex. The snare co complex is made from BNIP1, It's kind of far down there, let's draw it up here. Uh, BNIP1, use one, and synapsin 18. Synapsin 18, or wait, syntaxin, sorry. Syntaxin 18. The syntaxin 18 is the actual snare protein, and these are just uh, other accessory proteins. And this complex, allows it to, um, th or this NRZ co uh, tethering complex is what actually interacts with the snare complex on the ER membrane. Specifically, we see interaction between RN1 and BNIP. Uh, the NAG complex interacts with US1. And so through these two interactions, the NRZ complex is basically tethering the droplet, lipid droplet to the ER membrane. And why is this important? Because it appears that the, um, this process is, is critical for the formation of lipid droplets. Lipid droplets are somehow being transferred across these two membranes. And DGAT1 and 2 is, is critical for this process. Those are important lipid synthesizing enzymes. Exactly how this happens uh, is not understood. Lipid, this is the process of lipid transfer, but a bunch of question marks because they didn't necessarily identify how it happens, but the interaction, so that this, this, um, this pathway is critical for the transfer of lipids to the lipid droplets and their, and their the formation. So just to summarize, we have the RAB3 gaps that they function as GEFs. They, ex, uh, they're guanine exchange factors that give RAB18, it's GTP. When RAB18 gets its GTP, it's able to associate with the lipid droplet membrane. When it's on the lipid droplet membrane, it's able, and with its GTP, it can interact with its effector, ZW10. ZW10 is part of a larger complex composed of NAG and RENT1. And this is known as the NRZ tethering complex. Specifically, it tethers to BNIP1, use one and syntaxin 18. And syntaxin 18 could possibly be, I don't know, fusing the membranes since it's a snare protein and snare proteins are known to do that. So perhaps this is um, the mechanism. I don't know if they had the resolution to really determine if that was happening, but that'll definitely be an area of future research. So the next couple of slides, we're gonna look at some figures from the paper and then wrap it up. 
in this slide, we see simply that uh, knocking out Rab18 in adipocytes, they also used um, some other cell types, but knocking out Rab18 causes massive enlargement of lipid droplets. So they're staining for lip lipid droplets with this bodipity or bodipi. And bodipi is a new, uh, neutrally charged lipid that will um, basically accumulate in the lipid droplets. And it, when Rab18 is lost, we see massive accumulation of lipid droplets. And when Rab18 is then transfected in these Rab18 deficient cells, it restores their ability to form lipid dro droplets correctly. So they can restore the phenotype by just supplying Rab18. So on the left, we are seeing our independent variables like Rab, or, or sorry, GAP1, KO. So they're knocking out Rab3, GAP1, and Rab3, GAP2. And in green, or I guess in all these different inlays, we're looking at some of the dependent variables, basically seeing what's happening when we knock out GAP1. This is our control. So this is what Rab is supposed to look like under normal conditions, right? It looks like it's attached to all the lipid droplets. Indeed, these are the lipid droplets. So, um, sorry, these mark the membrane of the lipid droplets. And these are the, the core of the lipid droplet. And you see, not surprisingly, Rab18 is all over the lipid droplets, right? Well, what happens when you knock out uh, Rab's GEF, the Rab3 GAP1 and 2? Well, look what happens to Rab18's localization. It's everywhere. It's very diffuse. It's not localized to... Uh, lipids, it's just everywhere in the cytosol. And you can see the um, the membranes right here of the lipid droplets. You see the core of the lipid droplets. And when it's all merged together, you can see that the Rab18 is basically nowhere to be found. It's not, when, when these gaps are knocked out, Rab18 doesn't seem to have a preference for lipid droplet membranes. So I skipped a bunch of figures, primarily amino precipitations that were showing the interaction of Rab18 with the NRZ complex and how it was critical for lipid droplet formation. In this slide, we're seeing why Rab18 NRZ interaction is so important. Because when the Rab18 complex is disrupted in these two conditions, this is the uh, ZW10 knockout. I kind of clipped it out a little bit because it didn't fit but NAG knockout as well. So what exactly happens? This is the control, this is what's supposed to happen. What is supposed to happen? Well, we have use one right here. Remember use one is basically our marker for, use one is our marker for the ER contact sites with the lipid droplets. We have our lipid droplets with this in this figure. Then we have our RAB18 right here. Not surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap between our use 18 and our RAB18. There's our use 1 right here and RAB18 down there. Uh, what about when we knock out NAG, part of the NRZ complex? Well, we don't really see very many ER contact sites. But more importantly, our RAB18 is no longer very interested in our uh, ER contact sites. They appear to be kind of um, off the target, right? These, like these two lipid droplets right here are, are not interacting with the ER contact sites. See the same thing down here. And in graphical format, we see it right here. The percentage of cells with lipid droplet localization of use one. Normally, roughly 80, 5% of cells have lipid droplets that are in contact with the ER. If you knock out NAG or ZW10, you only get about 10%, maybe 20% of lipid droplets that are associated with the ER membrane or the use one positive ER membrane. And to really drive home these points, the authors did some uh, ultra structural uh, TEM or transmission electron microscopy. And clearly, cells that are missing Rab18 have no ER contact sites. So this is a lipid droplet, 
and there's no ER out here. There's no ER out here, and you can see it in graphical format right over here. When RAB18 is gone, there's uh, no cells interacting with lipid droplets. Um, so these, I should probably mention this first, but these dark patches right here, these dark patches, they have labeled the ER contact sites using this really fancy uh, STX18 apex method. So basically what they've done is they've genetically attached STX18, our ER snare complex protein, to this other protein called apex right here. They've attached G, uh, STX18 to apex. And apex is a peroxidase that produces uh, an electron dense uh, DAB or DAB substrate. So basically, wherever there's STX18, there's DAB. And wherever there's DAB, we have dark, dense uh, staining in our transmission electron microscopy. So basically, that's how they, they labeled the ER membranes. And you can see that lipid droplets um, are clearly associated with the ER contact sites when RAB18 is overexpressed and in controls. But when RAB18 is knocked out, we don't see any, um, we don't see any uh, ER membrane in sight. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, if you have any questions at all or have a correction, please comment and let me know. And I hope you learned something new today.